Matthew 26, verse 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's have prayer together. God in heaven, we come and we pray and we ask that your spirit would dwell with us, that we would be full of your spirit and in awe of our Lord and his sacrifice, that you prepare our hearts to participate in the Lord's Supper, that our confidence would rest in Christ and Christ himself would strengthen us and we would have an assurance of pardon as we prepare to take uh, from these elements and for sinners among us and backsliders, we pray they would be restored. And so we are grateful uh, for the word of God, and we pray now you bless it as it has been read and as it will be preached in Christ's name. Amen. So I'm talking about the Lord's Supper today, and we will be having the Lord's Supper very soon after the sermon. But just to update you on where we are and where we've landed in the Gospel of Matthew, this is the Passover week. So we're in the middle of the Passover week, or well past the middle now, is Jesus will be crucified on the Friday, or is crucified on the Friday, and this is late on Thursday that this text is taking place. Judas has already betrayed Jesus, that is known. The disciples prepared the Passover, and Jesus has revealed at the Passover meal we looked at last week, he has revealed at the meal that one of them is a traitor. It doesn't seem that the other disciples know who the traitor is, but Jesus did tell Judas that he indeed, Judas, is the traitor. This is the Passover meal that they're still eating, partaking in. It's late Thursday with the master set to be crucified on Friday. So last week we were together. They were participating in the Passover, they're eating the Pas Passover, and they're still eating the Passover this week. So we're, we stopped mid-meal last week, and we're there again. In this section, Jesus explains the Passover in the context of the New Testament. He explains the Passover in the context of the New Testament ordinance the Lord's Supper, and he explains the Passover in light of the Old Testament, and then he explains the Lord's Supper in light of the Old Testament, and it all points to Jesus Christ. Um, the Passover, if you look, well, I'm just going to read it, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7 tells us that Jesus fulfilled the Passover, and so it actually says... In that text, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you already are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So that tells us that this was the last Passover. It wasn't just the last supper, it was the last Passover. Because the Passover was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And in essence, this is the final legitimate Passover. So, there's not, the, the, if anyone's celebrating Passover today, it's not at the commandment of God. This was the final one, because as 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7 tells us, it found its fulfillment in the death of Christ. And so this is the final one. The Lord's Supper, in this context, points back to the Passover. It's on the Passover. And then the Lord's Supper points to the death of Christ. And so from our vantage point, the Lord's Supper is pointing back to the death of Christ. And so the, the Lord's Supper is really a pivot in biblical history. It's a turning point. Because up until this point, they've been celebrating the, the Passover, that's pointing to the death of Christ, and now at the Passover, the Lord's Supper is instituted, 
and that's pointing us back to the death of Christ. So this is a pivot in history. The final legit Passover is celebrated in Matthew 26, our text today. One commentator, William Hendrickson, said it very helpfully. He said, Passover pointed forward to this. The Lord's Supper points back to it. And so if you understand your Bibles, if you're going to understand your Bibles, you have to understand how it's historically developed. And this was a pivot in biblical history. Much of the Old Testament pointed towards it. And now in these New Testament times, it points back to, the Lord's Supper points back to the death of Christ. There are groups today, you might encounter them, who think that we still need to celebrate, and it's mandated of God, celebrate the various Jewish or Hebrew festivals, including the Passover. But this is an illegitimate teaching. It has no foundation in Scripture. And what we are reading of today is the final Passover required of God. So you're not required to celebrate it. And while there's various groups that hive off and try to do their thing their way, it's very clear, especially from 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, that this all came to fulfillment in the death of Christ. He is our Passover lamb, and unless you believe that Jesus needs to die every Sunday or die every year, you, don't, you can't believe that we need to celebrate the Passover, because the celebration of the Passover was the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. So there's no need for that anymore. Today what I'm going to do is I'm talking about the Lord's Supper, and I've got three points. I'm going to explain to you what the bread represents. It represents the body of Christ, and then I'm going to explain to you what the wine in the Lord's Supper represents. It represents the blood of Christ, and then, finally and thirdly, provide hope of the second coming, because the Lord's Supper points back to the death of Christ, and then even as it assures us of the pardon and forgiveness we have in Christ, it points forward to the hope of God's final complete redemption at His second coming. So there's a lot going on in the Lord's Supper. I'll talk about what the bread represents, the wine represents, and then provide hope for the second coming. Now, in the sermon today, before I get into my first point about the bread, I'm going to critique a little bit how we actually do the Lord's Supper. I think there's some things we should change as we examine the Scriptures. I've thought that for a while. I've taught that before. We're yet to change them. But I don't want that as you come to the Lord's table after my sermon to be a distraction to you. I want you to participate in the Lord's table with joy and thanksgiving. But I do think in... We should leave here reflecting on how we can better reform our practices and conform them to the ways of Scripture, conform them to the ordinance that God has revealed here. So I am going to critique how we do it a little bit on at least two points, and hopefully that provides some opportunity to reflect and change how we do eventually, how we do things eventually, but I hope also that my critique does not distract you from participating in this with hearts of gratitude and receiving the assurance of God's pardon and salvation as you eat and drink of what is offered here. But let's talk for a moment about the bread. There's two elements in the Lord's Supper. The first is the bread, the second is the wine. And the bread represents the body of Christ. The bread is eaten first and then the wine is drank second. And a bread is a staple food in any society. It's your bread and butter, we'd say, in our common talk. And Jesus knew this because in Matthew 6, verse 11, he taught us how to pray. And he said, in our, in our prayer, we're supposed to pray to God, give us this day our daily bread. And so bread is, it, it, it symbolizes in one sense a staple food and God's continuing, sus continual sustaining of us through food. And in this, Jesus associates the bread with his own body. Look at what it says. Now they were eating, so they're still eating. If you look up at verse 21, it says, and as they were eating. So the eating continues. We stopped mid-eating last week. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread. 
and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples. He took the bread and after blessing it, broke it. So it's very appropriate to give thanks for your food. You should always give thanks for your food. And by giving thanks for your food, that's actually how you bless your food. I'll talk about that more later as I get to the wine. And Jesus thanks God for the wine too. But the actual giving of thanks and receiving your food before your meals and before you eat is how the food is blessed. It's how it's sanctified. It's, it's how the situation is made holy. And so I hope that before you eat your supper or your lunch or your breakfast or you eat throughout the day, I do hope that you follow the pattern of Scripture and that you yourself give thanks and receive the food as blessed by God through your thanksgiving. And Jesus does that here. He models that. And then he breaks it in front of them. You see, this is very emphatic. Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it. So at this institution of the Lord's Supper, the bread is break, broken in front of his disciples. And I think this is one way that we could improve our doing of this together. Instead of distributing all the little wafers that have already been broken for us prior to our gathering, I think it should be broken in front of us because of what it represents. And so this is a way that I think we should improve things. Because it represents his body being broken for us. Look at what it says. Now as they were eating, verse 26, Jesus took bread and after blessing it broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. It represents the breaking of the body. Now, Jesus' bones were never broken because Psalm 34, verse 20 tells us that. It says, he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. But his body is broken, and that his skin is broken. And his muscles are broken. The, the, his back is lacerated with whips. His brow is broken with the, with the thorns, the crown of thorns, as they dig into his skin around his head. And the skin on his hands and on his feet is broken. His nails are driven into them. So his body is broken, and the breaking of the bread together is the bread is actually broken. It's not just a metaphor when we say we're breaking bread together. It should actually be done. It displays the fact, and it reminds us visually that Christ's body was broken. The broken loaf represents his broken body. So I think that we should do that. goes on in verse 26, and he commands the disciples and says, take, eat, this is my body. This is important, I think, because some traditions that have been corrupted over time have the priest, it goes on today, put the wafer in the mouth of the person receiving communion. Well, what does Jesus do here? He doesn't place the bread in their mouth. He says, take and eat. And so we're very right to offer the communion elements to the people and have the people have you take it for yourself and hold on to it so that you, you feel it in your hands and you place it in your mouth and the, the texture of the bread and the texture of the cup, the wine, is to communicate to you something. And that specifically is that Christ has died and that your sins have been atoned for. It communicates to you a historical reality, a fact that something has done, and then it gives to you the historical or the theological interpretation of what is done, and that is it assures you that your sins have been forgiven. It communicates to you the forgiveness of your sins. So we're right to have people to take and handle the food for themselves. And so there you have the first element. I'm going to go on to the second element, but before I do, this little phrase here, this is my body, is something that people tend to get hung up on. I'm going to address that a little later in the sermon, in case you're wondering what that means. But I want to move on from the bread and talk about the, the wine. So the bread points us to the body of Christ that was broken for us. 
And the wine represents the blood of Christ that was spilled for us. This is the cup taken second to the bread. So there's order to this. The order is you eat first and then you drink at the Lord's Supper, which has been our custom as we've participated together. We eat and then we drink, and we've done that right. Verse 27 says, and he took a cup. Okay, so we took a cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, so again, he gives thanks, just as he did with the bread. And the bread, it says he, he blessed it. Well, I think the blessing is the thanks. The thanks is the blessing. And we should always give thanks for our food and for our drink. In fact, Scripture tells us, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4, tells us, for everything is created by God, or everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. And so the scriptures actually teach us that when we eat and when we drink, the food that we're eating in the new covenant, we have all kinds of options of what to eat. And when we eat and when we drink, our food itself is blessed and made holy by our thanksgiving and prayer. And so if you want to eat holy food, give thanks to God for the food. And now your food's holy. And so Jesus appropriately simply means set apart, food that's been consecrated. Jesus appropriately gives thanks for the, the bread, and he gives thanks for the wine, the cup. And I'll admonish you again, you should give thanks before your meals, before you eat. Even as, as we gather around the Lord's table, one elder will pray for the bread, and then another elder will pray before the cup, and they'll each do it before we take the bread, and then another one will do it before we take the cup. This is the order, this is right, this is done in Scripture, and this is the way Jesus taught us to do it. So, Although I have a few points of critique of how we do it, I think we're doing a lot of things right. And he gave it to all of them. This is important. Look at what it says. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. It's emphatic there. He wants all of them to drink it, and this is for all of God's people. So some of you might come to the Lord's table, and you might be feeling guilty for your sins. And you might think to yourself, I'm not worthy. I shouldn't participate in this. Because the devil's the accuser of the brethren, and he's throwing sins in your face. He's dragging up your past. But, but really, Jesus, is, Jesus commands you to drink of it, all of you. And, and why is that? Because as you drink and as you taste the, and you feel the texture in your mouth, He's communicating to you something from heaven. This is a heavenly communication that is coming to you. And the heavenly communication that is coming to you is your sins are forgiven. You're tasting and you're seeing and you're knowing that the Lord is good. Now, the old Roman Catholics used to actually deny the people the drink. So they'd give them the bread, but they wouldn't give them the drink, and it'd just be the priest that would give, take the drink. Well, that's terrible, because Jesus says here, drink of it, all of you. And again, as the bread represents the body, the broken bread represents the body, the cup, the wine, represents the blood. So Jesus says in verse 28, for this is my blood of the covenant now Moses had people put blood on the doorposts so that the angel of death would pass over Egypt. I've talked to you about that. And the people who had blood on the doorpost, their firstborn son was spared. And the people who didn't, God had their firstborn son killed. And that was pointing towards this Passover lamb, who was Jesus. And God has always ratified his covenants with blood. Always has. So an example of that is found in Exodus chapter 24, verse 8, where the covenant at Sinai is ratified with blood. Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Every time God makes a covenant with his people, there's blood there to ratify it. That happened even with Noah. God made the covenant with creation, and, and there was certainly a sign in the rainbow, but the covenant, but Noah sacrificed an animal. And so covenant ratification between God and man occurs with blood, 
And in the new covenant, it is the same, but this time it is not the blood of bulls, it's the blood of Christ, whereby this covenant is ratified. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 11 says something similar. God draws on the ratification by blood, and he says, as for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. So again, God's remembering the blood of the covenant, and he's promising them freedom. Christ's blood is the ratification of the covenant. It's the covenant is being ratified at this very point, or at the point of Christ's blood. And he says, I'm going to talk about covenants more in a moment, but I'm going to move on and then get back to that, define what a covenant is, and explain to you this context of the new covenant. But I want to show you the emphasis, an emphasis here, and an emphasis here is in verse 28. He tells us who the blood is poured out for. Look at what it says. No, it doesn't say for all. It says for many. For this, verse 28, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Many. And so the blood of Jesus Christ is... When his blood was shed on the cross, that's the point at which God's anger for sin was satisfied. There was satisfaction of God's anger achieved in the shedding of Christ's blood. And the shedding of Christ's blood satisfied the anger of God, not towards all people, but just for many people. Not all, but many People miss this, and some people get bothered by this, but this is plainly obvious in Scripture. Matthew chapter 1 actually starts out by emphasizing this point. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it says, She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people. See that? His people from their sins. Matthew 20, verse 28, mentions something similar. It says, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So at the point of satisfaction, when God's satisfaction was made, when his anger was satisfied, it was only satisfied as it pertains to the elect. And this is a picture of how the triune God works together. We're getting into the deep things of God here, but... These are important. And the triune God works together in that the Father himself, the first person of the Trinity, elects people to salvation. He predestines them. Before you have a choice, you were predestined. The second person of the Trinity, the Son, dies on behalf of the predestined. And then the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, applies that work in the hearts of the predestined by giving them the second birth. So you see, all three persons of the Trinity are working towards the salvation of the elect of God. And right here, this is noted. Jesus says it as much. And he says, verse 28, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So this is consistent with all the saving acts of God. In fact, Isaiah 53, verse 12, when it prophesies the death of Christ, it says, he bore the sins of many. Many. That's important for us to understand. God, Jesus didn't die on the cross hoping that his death on the cross opened the way for people to maybe believe in him. That's not why he died. He died on the cross for a specific group of people, the many. And you sit there and you say, well, am I among the many? Am I among the elect? How do I know if I'm among the elect? Well, you're among the elect if you believe. If you're showing signs of the second birth, you're among the elect. If you're demonstrating that you're born again, you're among the elect. If you have believed in Jesus Christ and his salvation, you're among the elect. They don't have a a mark on their back or behind their ear to determine whether the elect. The, The elect are determined by whether or not they believe in the promises of God. The salvation that's been provided. That's how you know whether you're the elect of God. 
Some are elect, some are not. And those who are elect are among those for whom Jesus died. Jesus didn't die for the non-elect. He died for the elect. His sin atoned for the elect. And that's clear here. This is, this, by the way, you say this stuff, and people say, well, why would I evangelize? I know I'm getting off on a tangent, but this is an important deal. Because people say, why would I evangelize? You evangelize because you believe God's elect are out there. That's why you evangelize. But actually, you have more confidence in your evangelism if you believe this. You can travel all over the world, and you can believe that God has His elect in the four corners of the earth. From every nation, there will be the elect. I preach the gospel with boldness and authority because I believe it is the preaching of the gospel that activates the second birth in the hearts of the elect. That that. That is what the Spirit of God employs to bring about regeneration. And so there's great confidence in gospel preaching because all of a sudden it's not my job to bring people to Christ. It's my job to deliver the goods and then the Holy Spirit brings the elect in. So it ought to give you great confidence in evangelism. But Jesus died for the many. That's consistent with all the saving acts of God. And as the 18th century John Gill said, he says, For the many that were ordained to eternal life, and the many that were given to Christ, the many that were to be justified by Him, and the many He'll bring to glory. But let's get back to this word covenant here. I know there's some deep theology here. This is very important, though. Let's hope you're tracking with me. Let's get back to the word covenant Verse 28, for this is my blood of the covenant. Now, that's a reference to the new covenant. Covenant is God's promise, his unilateral promise to his elect. And Jeremiah 31 talks about this new covenant, and the blessings of the new covenant include the new heart, regeneration, having the law of God written on our hearts, and forgiveness of sins. And all of those things go together. So the, the promise, God's covenant with Abraham, was a covenant that he made with the Hebrew nation and contained within God's promise to Abraham was that God would use the seed of Abraham to bring forward the new covenant to not necessarily the Hebrew nation, but the elect from all nations who would form the new covenant community, which is the church, the gathering of the regenerate. Whereas the covenant with Abraham... In the Old Testament times, included the regenerate and the unregenerate. The new covenant community is exclusively the regenerate, the born again. And if you're born again, your sins are forgiven. There's the forgiveness of sins. Verse 28 tells us the promise of the new covenant, the great promise of the new covenant is regeneration. It's having the law of God written on your heart. And look at this, for the forgiveness of sins. God has covenanted with you that your sins will be forgiven. This is the promise of the Lord's Supper. Hebrews 9.22 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so the bread and the wine point back to the death of Christ, but they, they don't just memorialize the death of Christ, they interpret it for us. And how they interpret it is they tell us, when you partake of them, that your sins are forgiven. And so it's, it's fascinating to me that last week as I was preaching... There is introspection that is being provoked in the hearts of the disciples. Jesus says, one of you is a traitor. And the reaction is, each disciple goes by and says, is it, is it I, 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 is it I? And now, and now what does Jesus do? And then he gives them the Lord's Supper and he says, this is for the forgiveness of sins. This is an assurance that they're pardoned. And so maybe some of you are struggling with assurance. Well, take the Lord's Supper believing in what the Lord has done for you, and there's an assurance for you. you. You eat it, you taste it, and you receive this assurance that, yes, indeed, your sins are forgiven, that the blood was shed for you and the body was broken for you. God's anger has been pacified in Christ, and you have no sins counted to your account. And Christ's righteousness has been imputed to you. It's yours. And so... The bread 
and the wine all point back to the death of Jesus, and they all communicate to you that you have the forgiveness of sins and you're part of the new covenant. This is a great blessing of God. We taste the elements and we know that we are forgiven. This is the assurance that many of you might be looking for. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of a, I don't like kind of going down this path, but I, I have to because I think that it, this text actually brings about or brings to the surface some bad teachings. I referenced it earlier, but you look at the statements here where Jesus is in verse 26 in reference to the bread, this is my body. And then you look at the statement in verse 28, he says, this is my blood. And so I want to deal with that little word is there. It's important. And the papists, Church of Rome, Roman Catholics, they believe in what you call the doctrine of transubstantiation, which is a major issue. And it, this text surfaces that issue. It brings it to the fore. And Rome teaches that the bread actually becomes the body of Christ and the wine actually becomes his blood. So they think that when you gather around the communion, actually, Jesus is being sacrificed by their priests. Is they say their prayers and somehow the elements are turned into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. This is what Rome teaches. But let's, first of all, make the point, let me make the point, first of all, that the word is there, as you look at it, where it says, this is my body, this is my blood, has a semantic range. And R.T. France points this out. He says it has a range for either complete identity or symbolic equivalence, which means when you say that, when the Bible says this is, it could be saying that is absolutely it, or there's a symbolic equivalence going on. And this happens at various points in Scripture. So, for example, in Matthew 13, verse 37, there's a symbolic equivalence where it says the good seed is the Son of Man in a parable. Is, what do you say? Jesus is seed? No, it's, it's just that you, you're understanding from the context that there's a symbolic equivalence in that. Jesus is called, calls himself a vine. He calls himself a door. He calls himself the Lamb of God. In fact, when John the Baptist first sees, says Jesus, sees Jesus, he says, Behold the Lamb of God. But we know he's not a vine, he's a man. We know he's not a door, he's a man. We know he's not a lamb, he's a man. These are all symbolic equivalents. Jesus is called a fountain and a rock at other points. And so my point is, is that the context of the immediate passage and the context of the overall Scripture tells us whether we're dealing with complete identity or symbolic equivalence. Jesus is sitting here with his disciples. He's yet to be crucified. So his blood hasn't even been poured out yet. Okay, he's yet to go to Gethsemane. His blood hadn't been shed yet. His body hadn't been broken yet. And he's sitting there in the very room and he's offering them wine and he's saying, this is my blood, but yet it still tastes like wine. Well, what's going on? There's a symbolic equivalence just as there is in other parts of Scripture. And yet Rome goes to this text and they say, no, no, this, is, this is, means he's actually transforming it into blood and, and body. And there's other various strands of Protestantism that weaken what Rome says, but they kind of go in that same direction. But let me just say that transubstantiation, the doctrine of Rome, is blasphemy. That's idolatry. And it's a fabrication of a superstitious mind. Okay? Jesus isn't sacrificed every week on the altar. He was sacrificed once and for all. Where his blood was poured out once and for all for our sins, and his body was broken once and for all for our sins. So that's something I have to talk about as I come to this, because it pertains to some bad teaching some people have received. But as we come to the communion, the bread represents the body, and the cup, the wine represents the blood. 
And as I come to this, I offer one more critique of how we do communion, and this is a little longer critique. I talked about the breaking of the bread. I think we should do that, but this is a longer one. The cup contains wine, not grape juice. Wine. The Greek word comes out in verse 29. He says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine. The, the literal translation is that which grows of the grapevine. This is an idiom that means wine, not grape juice. And in fact, 1 Corinthians 11 is very clear about this because the, the church was getting drunk not on communion grape juice, but communion wine. And in those days, you'd have the grape harvest, bringing in the vintage was only occurring at certain times of the year, and you didn't have refrigeration, so it would have been possible to store your, um, your grape juice for very long. It would have eventually fermented if you treated it properly. And the fermented grape juice, which is wine, would keeps the bugs out, the bacteria out, because it's producing alcohol. And so it's very clear that with, if you're going to read this with the mind of the original audience, what is being communicated here is, is not drinking grape juice, it's drinking wine. In fact, this is what the church practiced for 1,900 years until the mid-19th century when the feminists and the prohibitionists brought their fanaticism into the churches and they guilted the churches into using they're crusading and rightly crusading against drunkenness, wrongly crusading against the good gift of God and wine. And they brought their fanaticism into the churches and guilted them into using grape juice instead of wine. And there was a really sharp businessman by the name of Welch who made a lot of money on that. Produced Welch's grape juice after he figured out how to pasteurize it. But this was, in, this was 150 years ago, that's what I'm trying to say, that this happens. And so these were fanatics. And it's interesting because Ch Charles um, Spurgeon wrote about this in January of 1876 in volume four. Someone might want to reference this, I'm sure, to see if I'm telling the truth. Volume four, page 348 of his Sword and Trial magazine. And he said this, it's actually quite funny, he gets kind of cheeky in, in dealing with these people. He says, the fact is, there is not and there never was and never can be such a thing as unfermented wine, though it suits men to call their messes by that name. He goes on, and this is where he gets cheeky. He said, at the same time, it should be observed that much which is called wine in this country is not worthy of the name. And it is a shame to remember our Lord's death by drinking such vile decoctions. <laughs> so he was complaining about the quality of English wine. But he's talking about the Lord's Supper here, and he says, Let it be really wine, as pure and good as can be had. And no communicant has then any scriptural right to object. And this was a polemical argument against the fanatics that were coming into the church. The context of the article is clear that he wrote. They were trying to pressure him into changing the, 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 um, the, the communion table and changing it so that they used wine instead of, or used grape juice instead of wine, and he wanted nothing to do with it. And he says, there's no such thing as unfermented wine. And it was clear in the New Testament that that's what they would have used. And in the context, you, you know, you have your vintage that comes in and you very quickly either have to ferment it or it doesn't fer ferment it where it turns into wine or no good. Didn't have fridges in those days. And so this is something that bothers me about how we do communion. It's something that's been going on for a while and I've addressed it before. It has been the custom of our church. It's a custom that existed before I came here, but it does bother me. And I pray about it, and I pray the day will come when we change this. And we go back to the old way of doing things, the scriptural way. But I don't want this to become a distraction for you as you partake in the Lord's Supper. I think Christians ought to get along, and there ought to be patience with one another. And when concrete forms over 150 years, it takes a while for it to become malleable again. So, but I do think it needs to change. Now, some will come to me, and they'll hear me say that kind of thing. And they'll say, well, what about people that are tempted to get drunk? 
What about those people? And the answer is, is very simple. Don't get drunk. Don't get drunk. I mean, 1 Corinthians actually dealt with that, and they were getting drunk on communion wine. And Paul, when he addressed the issue to the Corinthian church, he didn't say, stop using wine and start using grape juice. He said, don't get drunk. And when the Holy Spirit of God inspired 1 Corinthians 11, he knew about the situations that we'd be facing in our own day. And changing what our Lord commands is, no, is not excused by the uncontrollable appetites of a few fools. They can't control how much they drink. Those people need to change their ways. You don't change the, or, the ordinances of God to accommodate bad behavior. Okay? So this is a concern of mine. And in fact, I, I found it interesting that when we were dealing with people that wanted to move church online a couple of years ago, one of the things that they would say is, well, you see, we accommodated the communion table to... Um, some concerns of society in the 1850s, and we haven't changed since. And so this accommodation thing, it, it creeps in. And then there's people that want to justify using um, Doritos and Coke for communion, coffee and Timbits. Well, well, look, I think it's very clear. Let's just get back to what the Scripture says. And, then I, and I've actually had people come to me and, and sincerely ask this, not trying to be miserable with me or ornery, but, but sincerely ask me and say, well, because we have a strong view on baptism. I believe that baptism is to be by immersion, and it's for believers only. It's for the regenerate because it's a symbol of the new covenant, not the old covenant, not the covenant with Abraham, but the new covenant, Jeremiah 31. And so it's for believers only, and it's by immersion. And we've had people come here, and they've, they've been baptized or christened as babies, or they've been poured on. And they say, well, can't you just accommodate us? I say, no, this is scriptural teaching. And they say, well, if you're so strict on baptism, why aren't you more strict on communion and start using wine? I say, that's a good question. That's a good question. Glad you asked. I wish I had a better answer for you. So I do think we need to change this. But I've taught on that before, and despite what some might say, I'm rather patient, so... <laughs> I wait for God to change the hearts of the congregation. It is what it is. But don't let that distract you as we participate together. I hope that you will drink and you will eat and you will do so knowing that your sins are forgiven and that you will taste and see that your sins are forgiven and that there will be an assurance of pardon for you in this Lord's Supper. But beyond all of that, the bread representing the body and the wine representing the blood, this is my third and final point, a foretaste of the second coming. So if you look at verse 29, Jesus says, I tell you, Pointing to the second coming, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now the Apostle Paul interprets that for us very well in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26, which I read every time we have the Lord's Supper. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So when he's talking about the Father's kingdom in this context, he's talking about the second coming of Christ. And this is really interesting. I don't, you have to be careful with these types of interpretation, but I think that there's something perhaps valuable offered to us as I make it bear on our text. And apparently, in the liturgy for the Passover, there were four cups. And they'd, ha they'd eat the, the Passover lamb, then they'd have the third cup, then they'd sing a hymn and have the fourth cup, and that would end the dinner. And so this looks like it's the third cup, because what, is, what precedes it is the eating, and what follows it in verse 30 is a hymn. Verse 30, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So it, it doesn't look like, if this was the case, they had four cups. It doesn't look like they had the fourth cup. They stopped at the third cup, then the hymn, and went to the Mount of Olives. If there were four cups, which... The liturgy of the, those people indicate that there was. And so when Jesus says here in verse 29, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom, there seems to be an indication he's going he's gonna to get the job done when the, when the kingdom finally comes fully. When his Father's kingdom is fully manifested on earth. And so something that this fourth cup is Christ referring to is what Christ is referring to in verse 29. Second coming, he'll drink the fourth cup with them. There's probably something to that, I, su I suspect. 
But either way, Jesus and Paul's interpretation of this in 1 Corinthians 11 points to the new heavens and the new earth, where he says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So what's going on here? I think this is very special. We eat, we drink, we know our sins are forgiven. We receive this assurance of a pardon, and then without fear, we get to look forward to the second coming. There's no fear of judgment at the second coming. None whatsoever. Because we know that our sins have been pardoned. They've all been forgiven. It's all been removed. You come to the Lord's Supper and you receive the Lord's Supper with joy in your hearts, knowing that every sin you've ever been committed, it was done away with on the cross. It's a beautiful picture of what our Lord's done with you, done for us. And so we're going to sing together. And then we're going to participate in the Lord's Supper together. And I'm going to invite you forward to receive the elements and take of them and then eat and drink together. And as you do so, as you taste and you hold the elements and you digest them and we do this together, you do so knowing that this is a sign of God that your sins are forgiven in the death of Christ. And you can look forward to with assurance that the second coming of Jesus Christ will be a time of joy for you when you sit down with him and you eat and drink again with him in table fellowship. Because your sins are forgiven and the Lord's Supper tells you as much.